بركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his companions his household may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless them all and bless every one of us آمين my brothers and sisters the month of the Quran and the Quran has in it shifa. This evening when I came, as you know, I was not feeling too well, but by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, moments later, I was told by one of my colleagues, you know, when you are reading the Quran, and this is something that is a reminder for all of us, Allah says it has in it cure. The Quran has in it cure. So as you are reading it, you're getting cured. The diseases of the heart as well as your physical diseases. So let us actually increase our recitation of the Quran for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a bonus, we will begin to see the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend in a way that even if you are not feeling well, inshallah by his will, you will be much, much better through the beautiful words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th Surah of the Qur'an, that is what we are talking about. You know that when we do good deeds, we expect a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The driving force should be Jannatul Firdaus, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am fasting, it is known as Imanan Wahtisaban. That is what I am supposed to be doing. Iman means with conviction. I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has instructed me, so I will do it believing that I'm fulfilling an instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihtisaban actually means expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm doing it. I believe that it's an instruction for me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two types of rewards. Number one, in this world, we would like to see the mercy of Allah upon every one of us. Is that not correct? So when we adopt what Allah wants us to adopt, wouldn't we like to see the mercy of Allah descend upon us? Ya Allah, I fulfill my salah. I stay away from haram as best as I can. I seek your forgiveness, O Allah. I fulfill my fasting. I try my best never to associate partners with you. I try to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, I expect you to have mercy on me. I'm hoping that you will have mercy on me during my short stay on earth. And this is why sometimes people ask a question. They say, Sheikh, I am trying to be the best Muslim. Why do I have difficulties? My brothers and sisters, Allah did not promise you that you will not have difficulties. If that was the case, there would have been no challenges in the life of the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Allah promises you that he will help you through those challenges in a way that you remain content and pleased with Allah. This is why Islam and Iman rotates around several pillars. One of these pillars is I bear witness and I believe firmly that good and bad fate is actually from Allah. I will be pleased with it. Al-Rida bil qada To be happy with the decree that Allah has chosen for you and I. This is part of our belief, my beloved brothers and sisters. So people ask this question. I'm trying my best. Why are things still coming in my direction? The two are not connected. The condition of your heart is what is important. You are a happy man. You have a challenge. You are struggling to pay your rent. You're looking for a job. You're looking for a spouse. You're looking for happiness. You're trying to quit your bad ways and habits. But you know that you're pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The condition of your heart, you will always be smiling. Whereas a person could be bestowed with so much in terms of this worldly material life and he may never be happy. He may not be content. So there are people who do good. There are people who do good and they just do it without any belief. I'm sure you've come across people who don't believe in God. They don't believe in the hereafter. They don't believe that there is heaven and hell. But they do good. Sometimes they are disciplined. Sometimes they have brilliant character and conduct. What happens to them? What will Allah do to them? I'm sure there has to be something in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions connected to those type of people. Well, before we get there, let me explain 
With us, like I said, firstly, we want goodness in this world. Secondly, we want Jannatul Firdaus. The day that we are taken away, we want a good death. You know, when you hear that someone died in the month of Ramadan, obviously it's great news. There is a chance that that person will be looked at with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they've died a natural death and they have not openly gone against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have not usurped the right of another. So you know, people say, oh, this person died in Ramadan. They're going straight to Jannah. Well, there is a little bit of detail in that regard. If a person commits suicide, for example, in Ramadan, what about them? We say, leave it to Allah. It was wrong for the person to do that. It is punishable. You and I know that suicide is haram. But if a person has done something evil in the month of Ramadan, then can we say that they're going to go straight to heaven because they died in the month of Ramadan? The answer is no, it's up to Allah. We know the warnings. We know how prohibited it is, but we leave it to Allah. The same applies. If a person is a drunkard and he doesn't fast and he dies in Ramadan, perhaps Allah may look at him with the eye of mercy, but it doesn't mean, not necessarily, that he will fly straight into Jannatul Firdaus. Let's remember this. So there is a little bit of detail. If you have stolen someone's wealth, you have usurped a, per, a person's uh, right, or you have, for example, oppressed someone, you cannot expect if you were to die in Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will simply grant you Jannah without taking account of what you did to other people. You stole their wealth. What about that? You need to answer. You, you oppressed someone. You swore them. You made life difficult for them. You need to answer. So these are all details governing the death. However, it is indeed a blessed death to die in Ramadan. We cannot deny that. It's like it's a blessed day. It's a blessed death if a person were to die, for example, in Makkah al-Mukarrama, in the Mataf, in the Haram. It's a blessed death. We indeed acknowledge that it's blessed. That blessedness is because either the timing is blessed or the place is blessed. A person who passes away in salah, Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant that to us. And if you want it, remember, increase your salah so you increase the chances of passing away in salah. A month back, I'm sure we saw one of the reciters of Indonesia who passed away while reading the Quran. Subhanallah. It was something unique. I'm sure we all make dua that Allah grant him Jannah and that Allah give us also a good death. So my brothers and sisters, we should be concerned about the hereafter. If you live with a concern about how you are going to fare in the hereafter, Allah will give you a good death, inshallah, inshallah. You are concerned about how you are going to fare on the day of judgment. You read your salah, you give your zakah. Inshallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will have a beautiful death and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you into his mercy. Someone passes away, what do we say? Rahmatullahi alayhi. Intaqala ila rahmatillah. The person has passed into or crossed over into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah have mercy upon all of us. Those who don't believe in the hereafter, when they do good, Allah says, I don't oppress anyone. I have to acknowledge. What do they believe in? They believe that it's just this world and they don't believe in the hereafter. In that case, Allah says, we will give them their prize in this world. So what will happen to them? Because they were kind to others, we gave them good health, better health than you and I. Because they were really, really beautiful human beings, character-wise and so on. They were very benevolent. They reached out to so many poor and destitute. We gave them children who were the coolness of their eyes. We gave it to them. We gave them health. We gave them beauty. We allowed them to go on holiday, to enjoy the life because that's all they lived for. So they went to places you and I have not been. Have you been to Honolulu, by the way? Anyone here? They were there already. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Then Allah says in verse number 23, regarding those who don't believe in the hereafter, those who don't believe in Jannah and Jahannam, in heaven and hell. We 
we have recompensed them in advance for all the deeds that they had done, the good deeds. We gave them in this world in lieu of those deeds, whatever goodness was equivalent to their deeds. And then on the day of judgment, their deeds are like ash that is strewn all over. They are now coupons that are used. We receive coupons, don't we? We're keeping those. Inshallah, we need them in our grave. We want them in the hereafter, inshallah. But if you were to spend your coupons just now, everything is gone. What do you expect to be in store for you later on? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. The reason I start with this verse, we need to save ourselves, not just from the disasters of this world, but wallahi, more importantly, from the disasters of the hereafter. Because we will be dead for a longer time than we were ever alive on earth. Remember that. And we will be resurrected and thereafter we will be living forever and ever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, before I continue to the next verse, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. No matter what you've done, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. You are not a write-off. You have not committed crime that is beyond the forgiveness of Allah. Remember this. For as long as you are breathing, turn to Allah. Seek His forgiveness. I promise you that forgiveness will be written down in your records. It will come on the day of judgment to help you. You sought forgiveness of Allah. Keep trying and keep trying. If you slip back into sin, get back up and go again. So Subhanallah. You know, a tortoise gets to the end because it keeps trying, but it is very slow. And then it gets to the end after trying once and twice and thrice. Have you ever watched a centipede? If you were to flick it or touch it, what does it do? It rolls up. It waits for a little while. When it feels that there's no one watching, it opens again and starts walking. Have you noticed that? We are like centipedes, subhanallah. Shaitan is flicking us every day. We roll back because we don't want shaitan to touch us. Once he's gone, open up again, keep on walking, subhanallah. That is your tawbah. My brothers and sisters, we are living in a world that is filled with tests and filled with a lot of sin that is very easy to commit, subhanallah. So remember, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Keep turning to Allah, keep trying one, twice, once, twice, three times, four times, no matter how many times, until you meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is my message for you tonight. Never lose hope. We are in the month of hope. Why did Allah have this month of Ramadan every year? Why does it come back every year? Have you ever thought of it? Because it's the mercy of Allah. You never know if you're going to see the next one, but it will come if you are alive. Allah gives you another chance. If you had passed away, at least you spent the last Ramadan of your life within the obedience of Allah. You tried your best. You fulfilled Salatul Taraweeh in the most beautiful way. Subhanallah. I was just calculating today, not to say that we are bothered about the time because Alhamdulillah in this masjid, the clock actually doesn't mean anything. I think you noticed that, right? We are there to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must, we must make a difference. We are fortunate. We kick off Adhan at 7 o'clock, mashallah. 10 past, Alhamdulillah, we have Salatul Isha. It takes about 10 minutes. Thereafter, one and a half hours for the Taraweeh and another 10 minutes for the Witr and then we're up. Nine o'clock, we're up by the will of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Speaking for exactly 30 minutes on the dot and then we disperse. We disperse. It's the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How have we spent our evening? It's a massive sacrifice. My brothers, may Allah have mercy on you. My sisters, may Allah have mercy on you and your offspring, your children. It is a huge sacrifice. It's not easy to come to the masjid, stand in the heat. This goes wrong, that goes wrong. A person is there. You know, people might be, may Allah make it easy for us, smelling of fries and samosas and savories. And it's quite a jihad. A person burps this way and that way. You don't know how they are punishing the people. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We are doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You relate to what I'm saying. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. You know how... The month of Ramadan is a month of the mercy of Allah. Allah witnesses you planning in advance that I'm just going to open my fast and I'm going to immediately make Salatul Maghrib, quickly get ready and rush to the masjid. Allah knows that you're doing this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever waste your coupons. Remember that. Allah knows it. Have hope in the mercy of Allah. He loves you. That's why you are in his house. He loves you. That's why you are listening to a good Talk of the Quran and the Sunnah to draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not love you, you wouldn't even be listening to anything close to, to that which brings you close to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us.
So this is a beautiful, beautiful time of the year. It keeps on coming back because if we've spent the year, we might have dilly-dallied a little bit. We may have faltered a little bit. Allah says, hang on, I give you another month of Ramadan. Subhanallah. We should seek forgiveness even before Ramadan. But Ramadan is a season, everything for sale. Way, way cheaper than what it would be outside the month of Ramadan. The chances of you achieving the forgiveness of Allah in Ramadan are the highest possible chances than any other time during the year in the Islamic calendar. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard Jibreel alayhi salam say, وَيْلٌ لِمَنْ أَدْرَكَ رَمَضَانَ فَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهُ And he said, Ameen. What does that mean? Destruction be upon the one who witnesses the month of Ramadan and still did not achieve forgiveness. Imagine if forgiveness was a bottle and there were thousands of bottles here in the masjid and there are only hundreds of us. For example, and we needed desperately the bottle and we walked out watching the bottle and we didn't pick it up. Who is the fool? Who is the fool? We are the fools. The bottle is there. You're seeing it. It's in front of you. You need it. Pick it up and walk out. The mercy is there. It's in front of you. You need it. Pick it up and walk out. The forgiveness is there. Pick it up and walk out. Do not walk out of Ramadan without that mercy, without that forgiveness. So my brothers and sisters, what is extremely important for us to know is if we want to save ourselves from a lot of evil, we need to ensure that those we interact with and mix with and those we choose as friends are better than us or similar. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Furqan about friends. I said when I spoke about Surah Al-Furqan a few days ago that our thinking, our ways and habits connected to those whom we mix with, our friends. If they speak in a certain way, we will end up speaking in that way. If they do not fulfill their salah, we will end up not fulfilling our salah. If they are interested in the Quran, they talk about it. They are, for example, very close to the masjid and they are always there. We will end up going there with them. So make sure, my brothers and sisters, that you have the best of company. I tell you, in verse number 27 of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the regret of those who chose bad company. Those who could not save themselves from bad company. You know what that means? When you identify that the guys you're mixing with are not right, the battle to stay away from them is so great at times that subhanallah, if you were to succeed, the reward of it is very high. It's not easy. Your friends call you, no, where are you? Come on, stop being this, stop being that. Come on, we're just going out, we're going to enjoy. You know that they're doing drugs. You know that they're doing alcohol. You know that they're clubbing and so on. To stay away is not a joke. You deserve a medal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us all and our offspring and every one of the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers, my sisters, imagine Allah says, وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا On that day, the day of judgment, when the oppressor would see that he actually became a sinful person because of his companionship and because he moved away from the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will be chewing his hands he will be chewing his hands in regret, saying, I should have chosen the path of the messenger. Ya waylata laytani lam attakhid fulanan khalila. Oh, destruction upon me. I should have never had such and such a person as my friend. I should have never had him as my, as my friend. Because today is the day of judgment. And look at me. I am on the wrong side. I am with the wrong people. Because I did not detach myself from this particular guy. Subhanallah. What he did was, he drew me towards that which was wrong. He stopped me from obeying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never reminded me whenever I was going wrong. This is why I never feel bad when someone corrects you. Never. Someone corrects you, listen, brother, you're not supposed to be doing this, sister. You're supposed to be doing this and you're not supposed to be doing that. Don't feel bad. That particular statement will come on the day of judgment to bear witness for you or against you. You were told, Allah will say, we created a person who walked up to you and who gave you our message and walked away. And you reacted by feeling bad, spitting at them or 
speaking harshly to them and so on. But that was Allah's messenger came to you in the form of a person. And the message came to you from that particular person. So don't take it lightly. If it's a good message, listen to it. Subhanallah. لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا This person led me astray from the remembrance, from the Qur'an, from revelation after it came to me, which means I knew. I knew what was right and wrong. I knew where I had to be and where I shouldn't be. But this company of mine actually drove me in the wrong direction. And Allah says, do you know, shaitan is very, very deceptive when it comes to mankind. He deceives mankind. Khadul. Khadul means one who cheats all the time. He deceives all the time. He plays his tricks. He knows how to lure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about those who know that revelation is sent from Allah. They claim to believe. They say they are believers. And then they still want to adopt their own ideas and thoughts. And they worship their mind against the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? This includes two categories of people. Those who believe, or sorry, those who claim to believe, but in essence, they don't follow at all. And then those who don't claim to believe, don't believe, and they worship their mind. Now, I'm obviously not going to go too deep into this because there are so many types of people across the globe who worship their own minds, which means anything that comes to my mind, what I feel, that's it. I worship it. Whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense, that's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us mercy. We are believers, my brothers and sisters. We are fortunate. The biggest gift you and I have is the belief and the fact that we are part of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no bigger gift. We have the Quran with us. It's part of that package. We have the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's part of that package. It has been packaged for us in such a beautiful way. Our lives are disciplined. We have rules and regulations that we follow. Now, if a person looks at all those rules and regulations and said, you know what? I don't need to follow anything. I'm just going to do as I please because I just want to enjoy life. Well, Allah says, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ أَفَأَنْتَ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِ وَكِيلًا أَمْ تَحْسَبُ أَنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ يَسْمَعُونَ أَوْ يَعْقِلُونَ إِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا Powerful verses, verse number 43 of Surah Al-Furqan. Allah says, do you see he who takes his mind as a God besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He does whatever pleases him because he just wants to enjoy on earth. Allah says, what do you think of that person? Subhanallah. Do you think that they actually hear when you say things? They're not interested in what you're saying. Do you think they actually listen? They see? They don't hear? They don't see? Allah says, just like animals, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. We are never allowed to trample on the toes of another in terms of rights. Remember this. So my freedom should be such that I do not use it in order to block your rights. If, for example, I am free to do something, freedom, we're talking of the freedoms of today, I cannot use that freedom to block you from doing something. And I want to cite the example of the dress code. We believe that on the globe, the people are free, subhanallah, in the, in the secular world, subhanallah, people are free to dress how they want. I'm sure you know that. People are free to dress how they want. So. Because they say we are free to dress how we want and then they block people from covering themselves, it's no longer freedom. It's no longer freedom. Now, we have used the term freedom and interpreted it in one particular way, blocking people and stopping people from dressing how they want. So this is something that we need to think about. People use their minds, but the same minds 
If you were to try and apply what I've just said now, it doesn't make sense. How can you say that, you know what? You are free. There is freedom. A woman is free to dress as she wishes, but she's not free to cover herself. It doesn't make sense. So you have used the term to fool people into believing that, yes, freedom is to uncover. That's what some people think. Freedom is neither to uncover nor to cover. Freedom is exactly freedom. You are free to do whatever you have to. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to respect one another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to fulfill the rights of one another. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who do not trample over the toes of another. Because indeed that is very, very dangerous. And the reason why I cite this example is because we live in countries that are secular. But we are struggling as Muslims. Our women are struggling even to dress with the hijab. With the hijab. And it is being banned and blocked. We feel it's unfair. We feel that it's unfair. Because if we were to use the term freedom, how then can you just decide that this is not a part of freedom? One of the excuses used, and I'm going to spend a moment on this, is they say that the women who wear the hijab are oppressed. That is not true in the case of the majority in the free world. Subhanallah. Look at the sisters of ours here in this city of Cape Town, for example. Look at the sisters in the West, for example. Against all odds, they are wearing the hijab. They want to wear it. That's why they are fighting for their right to wear it. And still we want to shove down their throats that, you know what? You are oppressed. You don't know. You are somehow oppressed. You don't understand. Only if you remove everything and just show yourself completely, then we will consider you not oppressed. In fact, that is oppression. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, like I said, to respect one another. You know, I said it a few days ago. We are taught something, we will follow it. Let the others do whatever they want. It's a free country. Let them do. Don't interfere in their business. If you get a moment to discuss things amicably, respectably, you may propagate the goodness in a respectful manner because it may be your duty as a Muslim. They may want to propagate their way. So we are not calling for trampling on the toes of others. We are saying, you do your thing. Let other people do their thing. But you need to know, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are bound you have already decided that I am bound by Allah and His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, I will follow these rules and regulations. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was sent to us bearing good news and at the same time giving us a warning. What was this warning? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, using two terms, Bashir and Nadir. Bashir means a bearer of good news. He always said, there is Jannah, there is goodness, there is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a bearer of good news, Bashir. And on the other hand, Nadir means a warner. A warner in the sense that he said, look, there is the punishment of Allah. There is the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is hellfire that awaits people in the hereafter, who, those who were evil in this world. So therefore, there is a balance when it comes to the call. I do know that in this world that is filled with lots of difficulty and hardship, the message of peace and hope goes down much more or in a greater way than the message of fear. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But that having been said, we need to strike the balance between the two because al-imanu bayn al-khawfi wal raja True iman and conviction is a balance between fear and hope. You have hope in the mercy of Allah and you fear his punishment. You need to know that there is something that is called punishment. So this is the balance. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's message was absolutely balanced. We need my brothers and sisters to listen to the other side sometimes. I said moments ago, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. That stands. Once in a while, learn about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once in a while, go find out what Jahannam is all about, what hellfire is all about, or sit in a lecture, or you shall be told about it. You read the Quran, you find so many verses filled with the mercy of Allah, but there are verses that have vivid descriptions of hellfire and the punishment of Allah. Why are they there? Man needs a balance. And I end off by giving you the example of a child. 
You have your own child. You love your child to pieces. But the child knows you cannot keep on giving the child sweets every day. No. One day you say, hey, this is not how things happen. You know, you need to give them a warning. If you do this again, there is a naughty corner. That's what the naughty corner is all about. Why the balance? Because that is the upbringing. That is what man needs, the balance of both. You reward for goodness and you ensure that when there is evil, you deal with it appropriately. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us. أقول قولي هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك